Welcome, everyone. My name is Carolyn Gould. I'm president of the Chittenden County Historical Society. And welcome, you brave souls, for getting here. I hope when other people show up, be sure to tell them there is a ton of food to eat and not to be shy, but to get up. And please, if you want seconds, please get up uh, and get that. Um, just a couple of things I want to say. Generally, we have the Chittenden County Historical Society is a content-driven organization. That means we have uh, presentations every other month, except during the summer, when we usually have an annual meeting, but we're postponing it until October this year. We've gone through a lot of upheaval, and uh, we need time to get everything straightened out again. Um, we also publish a bulletin for members and that comes out roughly five times a year. And this is original research in every issue. Um, so it's not like a book review or anything. It's actually your neighbors going out and finding something that they're interested in and writing it up. And they are not necessarily trained historians, but they all love history. And so the topics are becoming more widely ranged at this point. Um, this was a, an article by a, a recent bulletin by a new board member, Elizabeth Allen, on a mysterious character of Vermont history. Uh, we also fund research, um, and we have just closed out this year's, but then it's open to everyone, I would say juniors and seniors in high school, all the way up until however old. And this is, again, to help, help pay for some of the Xeroxing and parking and all of the fees associated when you're doing research. It's not a lot of money, but it sometimes makes the difference between something happening and something not happening. So please tell your friends who want to do something to try to look it, at, look it up and try and understand it. The other thing I want you to tell, to tell you is that besides being a content-driven organization, we're also uh, membership funded and that we have a broad definition of history. It's not the history of necessarily the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812 and all of that. We're interested in material culture, the history of the environment, archaeology, business, manufacturing, whatever. Anything and everything that has gone on within Shinden County. And, and we're also an inclusive organization, meaning we want to hear from all points of view. Um, so, as all of this has been going on, I said we've been under a lot of uh, stress lately because one of our longtime members who has served in every position on the board from president to treasurer to whatever, died suddenly in March and it has left our organization missing her a great deal and needing her help. And, um, so we've noted this in, in, in the bulletin, and we've also been able to, uh, we're trying to look for a, a, a special memorial for her. But in the meantime, because of that and because of age-related retirements, we're looking for board members and committee members, people to help this organization along. It's not a lot of work, but you meet a lot of really interesting and great people. And it's anything from marketing to um, reading research papers, to helping out uh, put on the presentations, to finding programs and topics. So if any of you are interested, contact me here. Uh, I'd love to hear from you and talk to you about that possibility or after the presentation. And uh, lastly, you know that there are restrooms across the hallway. There's a code to get in. The code's posted everywhere, including on the door. And um, I'd also like to say that we, for this occasion, are putting on sale the three-volume Guide to Burlington's Historical uh, Neighborhoods. And it's really interesting. It was published over a period of 10 years and it has all kinds of facts and interesting stories taken from all types of, of uh, sources. So this one, 
volume three is like on the intervale and it's on north the old north end and all of this stuff but each volume deals with a cluster of neighborhoods and they're fascinating usually it's 45 dollars you can buy all three tonight for 30. so um i will turn this over to lisa evans who is vice president of the chittenden county historical society and also a founding member of the burlington history and culture center thank you carolyn all right, yes, my name is Lisa, but before I get into uh, introductions of who we are, I want to introduce sort of the most important part of the night, which is the Burlington History and Culture Center. I have uh, introduced that before as being a misnomer since we do not yet have a center but we're working towards something. We're working towards a vision, it's really exciting. And our logo here, I really wanna to explain to you because this gives you an idea of what our broad vision is. We have lots of colors uh, to symbolize the amazing diversity of Burlington. The center, you'll notice, is the cross section of a log. And the tree rings symbolize the birth and growth of Burlington over time. And of course, we have the cog wheel, which represents the predominant industries of our area. So the log, of course, is the, the lumber production, which was the third largest lumber port in the nation in the 1870s. The green gear around our log uh, stands for the many production and manufacturing industries that once lined the waterfront and were spread throughout the city. And the surrounding the gear are colorful triangles are uh, reminiscent of quilt square squares, which symbolize the vital work that women performed, right, um, in the family, in the service industry, in the workforce. And furthermore, triangles are symbols of stability, also of movement and innovation. Those qualities are important to Burlington's past and future. And uh, in addition, it looks sort of like a sunset. Right, we have our beautiful sunset right over Lake Champlain. So I want to hand it over uh, to Elise. And Gail. And Gail. That's a lot of stuff. Do these, are these working? Hello? Hello? They are working? A lot of stuff to plug into a um, one logo, isn't it? So we, want, we just want to introduce ourselves. These are the four founders. We had our picture taken under Henry's sign because we love, we love the colors, we love Henry's. Um, Henry's is the oldest restaurant in Burlington that still has its original name. So it's a very historic spot, so we love that. Um, you notice that there are only three of us up here. Uh, Melinda Moulton, one of the founders, she's on a research trip right now. Um, so I'm gonna introduce her. I, I get to talk about her first. Um, so she's partly responsible for this building that we're standing in. She was the CEO of this building and she, she and her partner with Main Street Landing down on Main Street and then this building. Um, so she's really, without her we wouldn't be standing in this building right now. Um, and so she led the, the redevelopment of the waterfront for 40 years in Burlington. She's a businesswoman, she's a filmmaker and an author. She has a TV show, Moments with Melinda, that's uh, syndicated across the state. Um, she and her husband, Rick Moulton, founded Rick Moulton Productions, a documentary film company that is presently making a documentary on Ethan Allen. Apparently, there is none. There's a lot of other things, stuff on Ethan Allen, but not, um, not a documentary, so she's working on that now. So that's Melinda. Um, I'm the next person. My name is Elise Guyette. I'm a historian and an educator. At one time, I was an educator at the uh, Shelburne Museum. Um, so I've gotten into the museum world a bit. Um, I've taught teachers um, many different venues um, in this country and in other countries, South Africa, China, in the West. Um, and what I'd like to teach them about is how to use primary sources and how to make history exciting in the classroom. Um, I think it's hard to make history not exciting, but it, sometimes it happens, right? Um, I've, I uh, co-directed a federal grant for three years where we did take teachers. We took them on trips around the country. We learned how to use landscape, 
all sorts of primary documentation. Um, and I've, I've written some books, Vermont a Cultural Patchwork and uh, Discovering Black Vermont are my most recent. Um, but mainly I've been telling stories of immigrants and how immigrants have built this state. Uh, and that's going to be one of the focuses of our center, we hope. And who's next? Gail. Hi. I'm Gail Rosenberg, um, and I have spent most of my career as a fundraiser and communication specialist for nonprofits. Um, that includes promoting the Big Apple Circus when it was at Children Museum. I met Elise at Children Museum. Um, and then I ran a capital campaign for Howard Center. I've written many articles for different publications um, on subjects as varied as Vermont circus history, uh, food, flexible work schedules, and even sword swallowing. I'm glad to do that. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the publications included the Washington Post in seven days. I love creating um, the Burlington Edible History Tour, which I did with Elise. We ran it for five years until the pandemic came. We did a walking tour for the Old North End on markets then and now. And in Washington, D.C., I started a nonprofit that was the first clearing house in the country on flexible uh, work schedules. And I just want to say that this project is really the most special one. And it's because every time we mention it, um, and many of you walked in the room and said, this is such an exciting idea. We want to be involved. And that's why you're here tonight. And we are thrilled that you're here because we want your involvement. And we want to hear your stories. There are many stories. Lisa? So yes um i was lucky enough to hop on this train early on um, and i was invited uh, to become a co-founder with them for this project i'm lisa evans i bring um, museum professionalism to this project uh, i'm the former director of the saint albans museum um, before that i've actually worked at a few different museums around the state i worked in um, brownington at the old stone house museum i've also worked at the noise house museum in morrisville currently i own my own business called rememory where i focus on protecting family legacies I do um, archival work, digitization, and also putting together tangible, memorable keepsakes for families. Um, going back with, with your photos and, and diaries and those sorts of things so we can protect them for future generations. So we're all so excited to be bringing our, our different talents to this project. And uh, it's unfortunate Melinda that can't be here today, um, but she is heading our advisory council. Um, and that is going to be a big part of this project because we will need some advising. Where are we going next? So there are close to 200 historical societies throughout Vermont. There are close to Thank you for the reminders. There are close to 200 historical societies. In Vermont, there are 250 cities, towns, and gores. And that means 80% have historical societies. It's amazing that Burlington doesn't. This project is about, it's about time. Um, there are two photos of, up here. Who are these people? And I'd love to tell you. Um, the man over here is George Walter Williams. It's his graduation photo from the UVM Medical School in 1909. He was the first black graduate. Walter, as he was known, um, was third generation. His grandparents were enslaved in Connecticut. They came to Vermont. They had a farm in Hinesburg. And um, George, um, their son left the farm to become a barber in Burlington. He came in, he started um, as a partner with another black man, uh, barber, uh, Abiel Anthony, and between uh, the two of them they had a shop. Then um, 
George got a solo shop, both on Church Street. Barbering was one of the few occupations that um, black men could thrive in. George, even though he made money with his barbering and was doing very well, did not want his son to follow in his footsteps. He wanted him to have a higher education. So he paid for his college education. And then um, his son, called Walter, um, came out, uh, came through the school and did very well as a doctor. Um, George, his father, was the contact for a new organization for black people um, with 44 members in, um, in the 1870s called the Good Templars, and they fought against the evils of liquor. And interestingly, there were two groups. There was a group of white people um, who were Templars, and there were the group of the black people, or, and we're talking about men. Um, and they met at the same meeting hall on St. Paul Street, and they had their different meetings, but they had them on different nights. One was on Tuesday night, one was on Wednesday night. The other photo is uh, Emma Bernhardt. And if her photo looks to you like a mugshot, it was. It's a police photo taken in 1918. Emma and her husband, Eugene, were not criminals. They were ID'd because they were German. And in 1918, there was a lot of concern about uh, Germans living in the, this country. They had to register with the local police department. They had to get fingerprinted. They had to fill out form for, quote, aliens as to whether they or family members fought with the Americans or Germans or both in some cases. Emma was a Kieslik. Some of you know the Kieslik Market name and Kieslik Construction Company. She was a young widow. She had two children. She met, um, she was living in the German community on North Avenue. She met Eugene and they got married. Um, Eugene had immigrated to Burlington from Germany, and the Mackenzie family of the Delhi meat fame sponsored him. They gave him shelter and a job. They were no, the Mackenzies were known as very kind and generous, and when, um, uh, when he was, um, I'm sorry, when uh, Bernard, when, excuse me, when Eugene uh, was abandoned at Ellis Island, and I will take a drink of water after this because I'm a little dehydrated. Um, when Ellis, when he came into Ellis Island, he was abandoned by the person who was supposed to pick him up. And so the postman, who was German, came to the Mackenzies and said, would you sponsor him? And they did, and they took him into their home. They gave him a job at the Mackenzie Company. Every day when he arrived, the German postman got the day's instructions from John Mackenzie in English. He translated them to German to Eugene. And Eugene was the first non-Mackenzie family member and first non-Irish person to work for the Mackenzies, and he rose to be foreman. And Lisa, you? Okay, so, uh, so our idea about telling these stories is just to tell you how many really wonderful, exciting stories there are that we don't know because we don't have, you know, there's not a historical society specifically for Burlington and there's no history museum. So where do you go to learn the history? So that's, this is one of the reasons. So we're gonna tell you some really interesting stories along the way and then in a few minutes we wanna hear your stories because we're sure you know some great stories like this too. So this, this is, um, all of these people that you see up here had businesses on Battery Street. Um, they all immigrated because of World War I. There's a, there's a push, of, there's always a push of immigration and a pull. So these people were all pushed out for similar reasons. Um, the, uh, Louis Hirschberg came to this country, it came to Vermont in 1912 actually. Whoa, let me look at my notes, is that right? Whoa, it is, 1912. Um, he, was a he, he was from Lithuania, um, so was his wife Bessie. Uh, they were escaping the Russian pogroms. Um, Abdullah and Ida Mady, I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these people, but he came in, um, I'm a historian, but I don't remember dates. Isn't that weird? So I always have to have like this. So he came in 1918, 
And he came from Damascus, and that's the year that Egypt took over Damascus during um, World War I. So he was escaping World War I. Um, and then the, the Fayettes, it doesn't sound like a Lebanese name, but they're Lebanese. The Lebanese people, as soon as they got here, changed their names. They were uh, Feud, but they wanted to be Americanize their name, so they changed it to Fayette. Um, so the Fayettes arrived here in 1910. They all got into businesses that had something to do with food. Um, the Hirschbergs, uh, he started out, um, when he first came to Burlington, he went to a Greek, re Greek restaurant or a Greek grocery, and they asked for a job, and they asked him if he would take a cart of vegetables and sell them around town. So he started by selling vegetables from a cart, saved his money, eventually had a, a huge warehouse done on Battery Street, which is at 180. It's where the new chocolate is now, which is fantastic chocolate. If you haven't had it, you have to go there. New and new, great chocolate. Um, own that, own that uh, uh, part of that building. In another part of the building was Abdullah Mehdi and Ida. And that building, was it's a big, huge building down there, right? That's not the exact same one that was there when they were there because the city decided it wasn't safe and they tore it. They said they were going to tear it down. They couldn't tear it down, though, so they had to dynamite it because it was too safe. It was too, it was too well built. So, but anyway, that's another story. Um, something about urban renewal. <laughs> um, so anyway, Abdullah Mehdi actually, he had a restaurant in that building, and he also owned other buildings around there. Um, that's what the little newspaper article is about him, um, but just because um, he had, the, like the Icemen would keep their, their carts in, in his barns that he owned. The whole big block can mean a city block, or it can mean a big building. That was the Mehdi block. That whole big building was named after Abdullah Mehdi um, from Damascus, which I think is amazing. His wife, Ida, was Canadian, and she was a waitress in the restaurant. The Fayettes, um, so maybe you're getting a little hint of the religions here. What we like about this is these were Jews, Muslims, and Christians and they all had businesses together along Battery Street, and they were all colleagues, and they were all friends. So we think this is a really great story. Um, the Fayettes came from Lebanon. They were getting away from the Ottoman Empire. Um, when you see Lebanese, you don't see Lebanese on the census, you see Turks. You see people from Turkey, because Lebanon was part of the Turkish Empire at that time, the Ottoman Empire. Um, so all of these people, they did they came, they worked hard, they saved their money, they all got businesses. We have the vegetable business, we have the restaurant and you know, the guy who owned Barnes, and then we have the family who had um, the Lake Champlain Fruit Company, also on Battery Street. So that's what we like best about this story. All of these people from different places in the world, different religions, all very happy together. So there's another story we'd like to push forward with this center. So back to the center. Um, we have some core values in our broad vision. And again, I say broad vision because we don't know what we are yet. <laughs> That's what we want community input for. We want you to help us vision this. How do we want to create our center? So our core values, in addition to storytelling, we have community engagement. That's going to be the most important part for this project moving forward. That's going to be in all of our activities, our events, our decision-making processes. We want to really foster a sense of ownership and collaboration with whatever this becomes. And yes, of course, storytelling is a big part of it. We have so much rich history that we can share, as Gail and Elise are going to continue telling you tonight. And it's so exciting. We know that you must have stories. Even if it's something that happened during your lifetime, don't forget, that's going to be history someday, too. Um, I think, you know, all the time about, because I have, I have a almost three-year-old and an almost one-year-old at home, and I think about gosh my time in the 90s that was not that long ago 
<laughs> but to them, it's going to be ancient history. Um, so, so don't forget what you're living right now is tomorrow's history. Those stories are just as important to us. But we do love looking back and we want to share that history that isn't being told right now. Where is it? Where, where is it hiding? So cultural history is a big part of this. You know, we have a dedication to exploring culture through both historical and contemporary lenses to encourage appreciation for those stories, for diverse perspectives, traditions, and the arts and humanities. So we know in our broad vision that, that we want you to help us create, that that is what we want to continue to lift up. And I'm going to pass it off to Gail for some more stories. So I get to talk about, I get to talk about the women um, and who have great stories behind them. Um, the first picture that you see says Stella Marola's home. This was where the Marola market was. It's where. Macy's used to be, Burlington High School now is, which is part of our history, and it's going to be an interesting story now and in the future. Um, and they bought this market because it had the second floor, and they saw an opportunity for them to live above the market, as so many people who had markets did. Um, they're growing, their family was expanding, there was room upstairs. And it was there, that market was there for 48 years. And as Elise said, urban renewal came in um, and so many businesses, so many homes were destroyed. Um, and that neighborhood had people who were not just Italian, but were French Canadian, Yankee, different ethnic groups were there. Um, but the Marola's market was the center of the Italian community. and. Uh, Frank Marola had an, un, um, an unofficial employment agency and he helped bring in people from Italy and he talked to the local business people and he was able to join the person looking for a job and the business looking for someone. So um, he was there. Now the story with Stella Marola is that you could walk by Marola's market and this house on a different day of the week and know what day it was. So on Saturday, you would smell the pasta jewel that was going, that was being made in her, in her apartment. She not only fed her children, and uh, they had a number of family members up there, but she fed every employee who worked for that market. If it was a Sunday, you would smell the tomato sauce just simmering. And that would probably be for the Sunday meal, it could also be for a big holiday event. And they would have 25 children, and they would have the parents come. Um, but it was Stella who would invite different people from the community who didn't have a place to go to. And she made sure to nurture them and to help them make this their home. The person, uh, the photo in the middle is says uh, Mildred McLaren, and she was a civil rights activist. She's shown with other women friends and colleagues who were members of the NAACP. She was hospitality chair in the 70s, um, and she organized other members of the community to, um, to raise money so that uh, they put on dances with live music, they had shows, they did a lot of things to help the NAACP. Uh, she gave a presentation on a trip to Tangiers that was sponsored by NAACP. She and her husband ran the J&M Grocery on Archibald Street, which is now run by her, her daughter Judy, still open, and tell her you saw a picture of her mom. And Nellie McKenzie. Um, Nellie, who I mentioned earlier as helping Bernard uh, come and have a home from Germany. And you could see the woman with the white hair in the front was Nellie. And the man next to her is actually Eugene, who, she, um, who they hosted and took into their home and business. 
and uh, Nellie was Nellie and her husband uh, were farmers in Shelburne. They moved to Burlington. They opened a little market. They got famous for their hams, for their sausages, and so they formed the first meat processing plant in Burlington, in the state actually. Their uh, Mackenzie's Meat was actually agricultural number one in the state because it was the first market. Um, they opened it in an old horse barn on George Street, and she um, made breakfast for everyone who worked for the company. She uh, made breakfast for the members of the police department, the fire department, and she also, if people needed food, they would know that they could come to her. Sometimes people didn't want to just take free food, so she'd find a chore for them to do, and um, she would trade. When George died, Nellie, who had um, very little formal education, was a very comp, she became president and she was a very competent president. And they got through the depression uh, because, partly because the sons were in the processing end, but two daughters, one a nurse and one a teacher, gave part of their salaries to help the company. So these are all very strong, very wonderful women. Hi, I just have to check my notes to make sure I'm doing the right slide. We divided them all up and it gets, sometimes it gets a little confusing. Um, so basically, we've been having a lot of focus groups and interviews with people um, already. We've, I, I don't even know how many so far, but you know, 100, you know, maybe, maybe more than that. Um, so we've gotten a lot of really interesting ideas from people. Some of them we put up here. Um, just to kind of get your creative juices going because the next slide we're just going to ask you questions and you're going to talk we're going to stop talking and you're going to talk oh hey okay and we're going to take we're going to take notes um, but before your turn comes does anybody know anything about these orange cars here it says on the top Mackenzie's do you know what kind of cars they are? Any car buffs here? What year? They're 1962 Valiants, and this is the way this is the way they used to deliver all around town. They had these. They put their signs up and they drove up. The salesmen told tell me that they hated those signs on top of the car. The, the, as soon as they drove out of the parking lot, this is on George Street, where the McKenzie House is now. Um, that's where this is. That's where their meat packing company was. The salesmen tell me that as soon as they drove out of that driveway, those signs would come down. And they'd s stick them inside the car. But everybody knew when the orange cars came, that's Mackenzie's coming to deliver. I loved them so much. I drive an orange car now. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Is, which one is? Okay. This is your. So this is your turn. We're just going to sit down and we'd like to listen. If you have some stories um, about who you think we should be talking about in the center, what we should be talking about, what time periods, where do you think we might have a center? Is there, is there going to be one building? Is there going to be satellite buildings around? Is it going to be, a I don't know, a sculpture garden? You know, it's just let your creativity loose and, uh, you know, and then how are there really exciting ways that you've seen in other museums to prevent to present stories like this? So this is what we would like you to talk about now. And later, if you get some ideas, we have posters in the back that you can write on the posters. You can write on sticky notes and put them on the posters. Um, but the rest of this time is really to listen to you about what your ideas are for such a place that we're trying to create. Who wants to start? Yes, thank you. I've recently done a series of paintings of buildings lost to the urban renewal of Little Italy. Mm -hmm. That was in conjunction with the Champlain College presentation that was done in November. 
But I, I also have done 20 other paintings of Burlington buildings, and I connected with another artist who's a fabulous photographer, and he's been doing really interesting photographs of Burlington landmarks. He's also a writer, and he's, he's writing works set in Burlington. And we just started getting so excited about the possibility of doing what he was calling an ode to Burlington. Mm -hmm. So this would go in the how department, mm -hmm. bringing a lot of players from the creative sector together. And I went ahead and contacted some authors, like Vince Feeney, who wrote The History of Burlington, and he said, oh, I would love to come and do a presentation at an ode to Burlington. And I contacted Thea Lewis, and she was all excited about coming and telling ghost stories at something like this. And there was going to be a writer's workshop, and there was going to be an art um, exhibit with um, ongoing events that would bring people into the gallery throughout the exhibit. And I contacted the Vermont Contemporary Music Ensemble. They um, have local musicians, local composers, compose just exquisite music that they perform. And they say, oh yes, we'll perform at something like that. So there's this, this real enormous creative sector in Burlington. And many of us are really plugged in to what we love about Burlington. Mm -hmm. And we would love to engage in um, celebrating Burlington in ways that bring people in. Yes. So that it's not just this center with the doors open and are people going to come by? You know, there's stuff happening there all the time, including kind of a working space. Like the writers do workshops all the time where they read their work and other people comment. Well, if Burlington writers were doing writers workshops in the cultural center, you know, that just adds such a vibrant um, contemporary connection to the past. And I imagine that the past would inform and inspire their writing as well. So right. on board, yeah. you know? <laughs> so yeah. you're imagining so a place, a building, with places for people to go in and do that. That yeah. would be. That yeah. would be what you would like yeah. to see. Yeah. And yeah, same thing with the, the ode to Burlington. It is about time, right? There is the drive, um, and there's definitely the desire. So anyone and everyone who wants to come together for this project, definitely, definitely. Yes? So I have two, um, two things. Uh, I'm just going to go off of what you were talking I'm also an artist. Oh, sorry, my name is Jen. Um, I lived in the older part. The older than for the better part of 20 years, and I just recently moved to a new studio, so I'm always very connected to the work here. Um, and I was involved in a different part of the art sector, and it was mostly thinking about old North End uh, arts, involved with the Randall, um, involved in the you know, community organizing work. Um, and so I Excuse think me, could you stand up and face us? Because we're having a really hard time hearing you. I can sit and face everybody. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> um, I was involved in a different part of the art sector. I lived in the Old North End for the better part of 20 years. Um, and I was involved in more community-based art um, and organizing work, um, doing street festivals. And I was involved one of the founding members of the Ramble, which has been going on for 18, 20 years now. Um, and I was really deeply involved in, in my neighborhood uh, when I lived there. Um, and I think that that's another, I think everything you said is 100% spot on and there's other parts of the art sectors that would want to be involved. Um, and there's also histories there, because when you go into any of these histories, any of these neighborhoods, you open up one door, there's 17 doors behind that and other stories behind that. Um, so that's the segue into my second, is I'm wondering if you haven't already, um, but Aaron Goldberg, who works for the Lawshall Mural Project, mm -hmm. is an incredible resource. And um, in, I, so I was, I was, in, in, you know, on and off involved or supportive of that project. But even in learning about that and thinking about Ben Zion, Black, who painted the mural that was the Lawshall Mural, all the histories around him, and then all the histories around the Old North End, thinking about Little Jerusalem, thinking about the Lithuanian community that moved over. So just in that opening that door, there's a ton. But I can also share. Um, Last semester, I, I teach up at UVM. One of my students um, was doing a research project for the Washington Mural, who was researching um, all the people who lived in Burlington, like, going through history. So I don't know if you've connected, but there are. We have. Okay, so we've there's another history yes. 
uh, research that's happening that is 100% related to right. this. And yeah. so there's just, so I'm just, yeah, and I'm, I have a lot of homework now. Right, great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just recently, a friend of mine is, is in a family that's sign painters, mm -hmm. going back three generations, mm -hmm. and I just found out that his grandfather was an apprentice to Ben Zion Black yeah. on Center Street. So mm -hmm. it's amazing the stories that you discover, you know, when you just tell people what you're doing. They say, oh, I got this story. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other stories or ideas? You know, I've I've um, I've heard a um, saying, and I don't I don't know if everyone is familiar with it, but I moved to Vermont about 16 years ago, and someone told me there are two types of Vermonters: the been here's and the come here's, and I'm a come here. <laughs> but you know what? There are so many stories of folks who came here and stayed, and like Elise mentioned earlier, the immigrant story, and it's still happening. It's still happening. Whether you know, maybe it's a it's a refugee who's coming here, um, you know, because they they're out of options. They need safety. Maybe it is someone such as myself who came here for college and stayed. You know, had a family. Um, you know, what what are your been here stories or come here stories? You know, some of us have families for generations um, who have been in this area. And, and Burlington ripples out. You know, Chittenden County is special. And we're so fortunate to have the Chittenden County Historical Society hosting this tonight um, because it, Chittenden has such a special mark on the state of Vermont. And Burlington is sort of like our, our little epi epicenter. So does anyone have a been here or a come here story? What what brought you here or what keeps you here? Yeah. Hi, I'm, my name is Pam McPherson, and I'm a fourth generation Burlingtonian, South Burlingtonian. And, um, but something that you said triggered a thought for me, and that was um, when you spoke about uh, writing and about people writing, the um, idea of, of workshops, guided workshops that anyone could come to, not, not anyone who isn't a writer, who thinks they're not a writer but feels they have a story yeah. um, that could come to and be guided to writing a story or some of their stories, and those would be easily then a, a part of the, uh, a wonderful part of the larger project mm -hmm. that might come from a very humble place. Uh, I'm not a writer, I can't do that. And I, I can see that easily being facilitated. Yeah. Um, yeah, I bet you could write a good story. <laughs> that, yes, I, they could, but they yeah. don't know it. Right, yes. exactly. Yeah, Yeah, that's a very good idea. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm Cheryl, and I'm Pam, I want to pick up on your story. I, one of the things that I learned with Elise during teaching days was, Elise said to class one day, history begins with your own family. And I think it would be a brilliant sentence to have somewhere in the museum so that the museum doesn't become a place where you go in and you find out about the history, but you're a kind of, you know, even if you live right in the heart of Burlington, you're, you know, it's not you. But I think the point is, it is you. And so to have ways, maybe writing, maybe drawing, while families are there or people of any age, to have an opportunity to collect stories even from each other in that moment. Um, one project that I did with young kids was um, ask one of your grandparents what their childhood was like or what were your parents like when they were kids. You know, just really having the museum be a place that encourages families to learn about their own family history and to tell those stories to each other and that that is able to ride alongside of all the other stories that are being revealed in the museum. Yeah, great, thank you. I'm thinking of what an interesting thing it would be to have a, how did you get here? session or sessions because of all the immigrants that are here and the people who 
been here and the people who came here, um, I would think there would be some very interesting stories from people. How'd you end up here? You're here in Burlington. How'd you get here? What yeah. brought you here? Right. What? Yeah. Some of them are going to be amazing stories. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We've interesting. interviewed some people at the AALB, <laughs> um, Association for Africans Living in Vermont, but mm -hmm. it's not just Africans anymore. So they don't use, they just use AALB and nobody knows what it stands for. But um, we've talked to people there and they have very interesting experiences. And they're, they're very similar to things that I read about from immigration experiences, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. The processes might change a little bit, but the reasons people, you know, are pushed out of their own country, the reason they come here, they're very similar for hundreds of years. So I think, you know, doing something like that with people who came at different various time periods <coughs> would really be fascinating and find out the commonalities we have mm -hmm. among ourselves. Yeah, you shouldn't do like a family tree, but to do it geographically, like on that building, or just like kind of making those connections that you would with a family tree, but to not have to a family, but to a place. Like a Burlington <coughs> family tree? But like thinking about the what, building that yeah. you were talking about, that's the new chocolate, like how many things has that been? Like, mm -hmm. I did right. this wonderful, I think you were with them more than a market tour, right? Yeah. I've done that yeah. a few times, I've brought students on that. So okay. like thinking about like, like these kind of market buildings, like what are these histories of these places and doing like this family tree, but making it very specific and geographic, whether it's a neighborhood, a group of buildings, right? Or like a specific yeah. building that has had many histories. And histories of buildings with the people inside. But exactly. It's not just the architecture, no, right? No, but the people who like- All the different people. History of people through the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating. And when we talk about um, different opportunities for volunteering, being some of the people to go out and start to gather these stories, it's a great opportunity for vol for volunteer work. Mm -hmm. I think just like build on that, which is exactly Please. what I was going to say, is mm -hmm. to take advantage of all our college students um, and the work that they can do and the work that they're, like I work at Champlain as a professor and we do a lot of work around digital humanities and I could see like a really great like digitizing mm -hmm. project that a set of classes could work on and and it's also a way for us to be um, responsive to the college students who are coming to Burlington only about a third of them are Vermonters um, so to get them excited about what is Burlington what is Vermont and to have those stories of like and you can stay here you don't have to be seven generations um, <laughs> but it, but that there are all these like really interesting research projects and technologies and different ways of doing hands-on learning that are happening with educators and students at these colleges that could be really easy connections. Yeah, thanks. Are you volunteering your students? I <laughs> probably am. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take yeah. it. <laughs> and yes. I have a class I already volunteer. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please, uh, David. Just tell a slightly different type of story, although it certainly is in the same tradition. Um, I used to teach at the UVM and it was in the water in building. And our, um, we had a new dean come in to assume a position in the College of Education and Social Services named Charles Tesconi. And I remember Charlie, who was a good, very good friend of mine, coming up the first day to stand in front of the, the faculty and looking out at the faculty. And he said, I want you to know that my grandfather was brought over here from Italy to do the carving on this building. <laughs> and his grandson is the dean of the college. Oh, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. And it was a very, it was terribly moving for him, and it is for me as I as I tell the story now. But uh, I'm there. I'm sure there. Are, I know there are lots of stories similar to that that might also be worth capturing. Right now. It's a great story. Yeah. I think yeah. our videographer wanted to talk. Yeah, all of this resonates with me. Um, on my mom's side of the family, uh, the Vermont Genealogical Society on the Pocket side of my family traced our roots back to uh, to France through uh, Canada and then down, you know, French Canadian down here uh, to Vermont. <coughs> um, my great grandfather owned a store uh, called Pocket Brothers on the corner of 
of um, the Spring Street and Intervale Avenue. Mm -hmm. And you can still see it's got that weird kind of funky corner on it. You could tell that it was, that it was, it was once a store. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and, uh, um, and then uh, just that my, my family has a, has a rich history of working, of uh, being part of the, working in, in, for the city of Burlington. From the top, my great, my great uncle on my mom's side was, was mayor of Burlington for 10 years. Uh, my dad was a cop. My, my wife's father was a firefighter. Uh, I currently serve as chair of the, of the, of the Burlington Electric Commission. Um, my uncle worked for the water park, okay, water park, the street department. I mean, our family, we've had at least, at least 20 family members, particularly uh, on my wife's side and in my, the pocket side of my family, that have had a long tradition of, of service to this city. Um, and I grew up on Intervale Avenue, right next to Clark Court. Uh, the top of the with the building at the, the house at the top of Floor Court was the was the uh, the where the monk where the it was not the rectory what do they call it the rectory or the or the, the, the house for, for the for the what the where was running St. Joseph's at the time way back in the day but can't think of the, the right word um, but our house at 62 Intervale where or where, where Spring Street and Intervale meet um, was built in 1899 my great grandfather bought it in 1902 Mom sold it about seven years ago, and so there's like five generations of us in that in that in that house. Um, you know, and back when I was growing up, it was very much we were talking about you know, the, the, down by the you know, there was the Italian section. This was the French Canadian section. The hill was still probably probably still to this day the Jewish section, where where Burlington, at least even to when I was growing up, was still very ethnically um, kind of divided is not the right word, but you know, sectioned out, um, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our, my family has a certain certificate on the pocket side is a very yeah. long, long history. And how do you spell your last name? My last name is yeah. Moody, I'm double O-D-Y, but pocket, traditional spelling, P-A-Q-U-E-T-T-E. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's you really have your, your family um, tendrils are all over Yeah, right? very much so. Yeah, yeah. and you know, I, I'm sure you are not the only one. I, I know that a lot of families who were in Burlington have stayed here for generations. So, you know, we're we're um, looking forward to, to bringing all of these stories out of the woodwork and, and sharing them um, and, and really showing off how, how um, beautifully culturally diverse Burlington is. Um, yeah. Topics that are tied to it, but the kind of the industrial and environmental impact of the downtown area. Like, there's so many small pockets of information in different placards in Burlington or in the Echo Museum or dispersed across Burlington, but there's no like central focus on all of the environmental effects of like all the industry that was here for like 200 years and how much, like, how what, what the impact was, what it is today, like, what the future looks like. Like, you know, the super fun site down by the Maltex building. We'd never know the history of that building or why it's just an empty forest. Like, ooh, it's like nature by the woods, but it'll kill you. Um, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. Like, why was it there? How did it happen? Like, I don't know. I, I wish there was more of like a central story to that and like tying it into like near complete de deforestation in Vermont. And, like, how the industry in Burlington impacted the whole state and how we're still recovering from that. Like, what that did to ecology. So I think I don't know. That's a topic that isn't covered a whole lot in Burlington, but I'll see more. Thank you. Yeah, that is a great point. So not just the social aspects of history. What are the, those other stories to tell, the environmental impacts like, like that? Yeah. I'm wondering just sort of on a more pragmatic level, of, do you see the center sort of being a clearinghouse for history in Burlington? I mean, there's so many sources out there. There's the UVM archives. Mm -hmm. There's the photo oh. archives. Someone we follow Bob Blanchard on Facebook doing the history of Burlington. Um, just lots of resources there that, in some ways, you could be the, the keeper of where all those things are. You know, you know. Yeah, we have a building. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, even as a mission, though, I mean, those things are, you know, they're all in different places. But you're, if, if I want to find out something about Burlington, you would go to the center. And you can help direct me to go, oh, you should go up to UVM and look in their archives. Or you should go to Champlain and look at the Llewellyn collection. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, yeah. if you get all these stories in, that's great. But I think you need to be able to take advantage of all the stories that have already been told and collected already to save yourself from trying to figure out 
definable again. Right. And, and just having partnerships with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, it will help support you. <laughs> Is UPM archiving Bob Blanchard's frequency? That's a little bit beyond our scope. <laughs> but we do have access to his archives. something in an academic library right um, and I, I was going to make it's a gonna stop soon, uh, I was going to make a comment about the NAACP image that you showed mm -hmm. we have um, quite a few copies of newsletters and some other papers from that organization um, and I, I think it the printed copies can add some dimensions that you might not get otherwise so the fact that they were um, organized to um, work on housing discrimination, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't just so they could have parties like your photo, but there's, a whole, there's other stories. So I think it would be good to right. keep all sides of these things. So mm -hmm. it's not celebrating, yes, but let's be honest about oh, absolutely. issues yeah, they and were, challenges. They were, um, raising money to yep. do things like that. They had. I have another picture of um, a man who's bringing all these cards around and it has a black hand and a white hand shaking hands and they're asking people, he's asking people to put them on their door, on their doors or near their doorbells or something. And what they were saying is, we, we will accept, you know, any color in this neighborhood. So they were doing things like that right. that they needed money to do. Yep. So what they were doing, they were having fun, and they were having dances, and they were having fa fashion shows. Great pictures in the free press. Um, but it was, to er get, uh, it was to get money so that they could further their, and the, their the activism. News, the newsletters and meeting minutes help provide their own voice, yes. too. Yeah. And you have those. Yep. That's so, great. So That's I think complementing the stories that you might get through oral yeah. history and newspapers with other kinds of documents. Right. Yeah, that's great really to know that that's up there. So I know um, we, we started a little late. So um, we have all sorts of fun things for you guys to do in the back if you noticed that when you walked in. So um, it is wonderful that you're already participating. So maybe you'd love to do one of these things. We're going to be looking for volunteers. It's games. Um, we're going to be looking for volunteers. Um, we're looking to grow our board of directors. Um, and also our advisory council I mentioned earlier um, and we need volunteers to help us collect these stories um, Gail can talk more on all those I think um, you already you already have been offering ideas what we want you to volunteer first are more ideas we've jotted down not jotted down written down every word you said it's on CCTV um, but please add your notes to the boards and um, in the back. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, we will help match your interest with all these ideas. Um, we would love you to take the surveys and distribute this to your friends. Um, if you take the papers home that are on your seats, there are different ways to, to provide uh, the survey answers. And as a fundraiser for most of my life, um, I would be remiss without saying we, would, um, we are always seeking some donations so that we could hold more focus groups, um, so that we could um, put together, do some more research, pay some people p at some point to help volunteer and help us with some of the work because we're volunteering all of our time. Um, and for ten dollars for the next for, through 2025 you could be a founding funder so um, that we are not having any categories in this building we're trying to make this um, as open for the public as possible um, and we are developing our website right now we're working with Edgewood uh, creative group the um, first run-through is very exciting. We hope to have that 
website up and running in August. Um, our name, the website will be, and we'll let all of you know, um, www, obviously, um, Burlington History and Culture Center with and spelled out, dot org. And in the meantime, uh, C the CCHS group has a website, as you've seen, uh, CC well, cchsvt.org, and there is a donate button on that that goes right to a PayPal a account that will come to Burlington uh, Histories. No? That's, it just Are you done? Oh, went no, up I there, know. so. <laughs> I just didn't know what I was. So, I think I'm um, on so Sorry. at any rate, uh, lots of opportunities. Prue? Yeah. Can you explain um, what the role of the advisory council for a little bit? Uh, yes. Part of the role is that as we gather all this information, and we've had requests for some space or some sites around every ward in the area, we've had suggestions for hub sites. We've talked tonight about having a building that you could have all of these um, workshops in and be the clearing center. So if um, the advisory board would be taking a look, what are the sites, what are the possibilities, how do you put some of this information together? And Elise. I think there's one more. Yeah. That one? There it is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I have a little. Um, um, I can just talk about these uh, very briefly. The Fayette sisters. This is on Maple Street. This is remember the Fayettes that had the Champlain Fruit Company. We talked about them. Um, I love that building behind them. Can you picture that in your mind today? This building right there. That one has the slate in all sorts of different patterns, right? Does anybody know why it's like that? Right. Prepare slates for me. And oh my, what an artist. I, I just yeah. cause an accident every time. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that was his, ca his catalog, yeah. right? You'd come yeah. and look at the, the roof and pick out the design you wanted on your, on your own house. You know, I think, yeah, that's a fascinating story. Yeah. Uh, I hope. They're the, they're our fiscal agent. When, before we had our own, any of our own, we, we didn't start this having a 501c3. So um, Chittenden County Historical Societies generously became our fiscal agent. So anyone who donated, the money went to them. They got their 5% and then we got to use the money. Now we have a 501c3 um, that uh, I did want to mention that these, this was, this was on everyone's seat. There are two U QR codes there. The bottom one goes directly into our PayPal account. So if you want to donate, use, I would use this QR code or that big long URL underneath. Um, so that's for donations. Um, and this one up here is to take our survey, which we'd love to have you all take the survey. Um, it has some interesting questions, some of, some of which we discussed today, um, but it also has some demographic information on it that we need for our funders because we told them we'd be interviewing and talking to a, lot, a wide variety of people. So the survey would be great if you could take it. It's really short. It doesn't take long at all. Um, yes? I've got an observation about that photo you just posted. I think you said those Fay the Fayette family was Lebanese. Yes, was yes. So that photo is taken I, my Lebanese family came directly from Beirut to St. Albans Bay, Vermont. Um, and she married into my Uncle Steve. So that's how she became my Aunt Kay. That was a very Lebanese neighborhood. Yep. A lot, lot of interesting stories on our food, 
tour. We loved Maple Street with so many interesting stories on that street. Yeah. Um, so when people start talking about it's interesting to do neighborhoods, there are so many interesting stories of so many different neighborhoods in Burlington that I keep thinking about. Have you been to the Tenement Museum in New York City? Any, it's, the, it's a fantastic museum. And there are different apartments. And they go into the apartments. And they tell the stories of the families. I, at one point, I started thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a museum that's like different apartments? You know, we could talk about various families, the way they do down in New York City, in, in the, with changing exhibits. I, don't, I haven't even said that out loud. <laughs> it's the first time I said it out loud. It's been in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, the candy shop here is there, there was a Greek candy shop where Honey Road is now. That building was a Greek candy shop, and we have lots of good stories about that, too, having to do with alcohol and things like that. Um, but there's one last, so we, we really appreciate all of you coming out. Um, which is that? OK, thank you. <laughs> so nice to have a young in here that can do stuff like that. So this is the final slide. Um, you, know, you can get up, mingle, talk to us, talk to each other. Um, uh, we have on that table in the back, there are three questions. You can answer those questions from what we've said today. So that's your test. You should Hope go back listening. Go back and take a test um, back there. there. There are little pieces of paper you can write the answers on. Um, be sure to write your answer to the question and your name. And um, at 7.30, we'll pull out. You have to be here to win. We'll pull out and see who wins things back there. So that's the raffle. Um, we have some posters back there on the wall with the same questions that we had up before, the who, what, when, where, how. We don't have a why. <laughs> we all know what the why is, the answer why to that one. Not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, of course, there's plenty of food left. You can take the survey right now if you want to. You can donate through. Um, through this QR code if you'd like. There's also a box in the back for donations if you want to just throw in, you know, a few dollars. Um, if you want to be recognized as a founding funder, put your money in one of the little white envelopes back there. Put your name on it. So we'll have your name to put wherever we're going to put all the names of the founding funders. And I think that's it. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you all for coming.